So as for a bit about Lord's exceptional background, he actually grew up in the Chicagoland area and actually studied at Northwestern University, who was part of Pi Tau Sigma, the Society of Automotive Engineers. And then upon his graduation in 03, he joined Honda Motors. We spent nearly eight years developing tons of vehicles, including the Honda Core, the Pilot, Acura RDX, MDX, especially as a suspension design engineer. And then he also helped design Honda's first ever active suspension system, first launch on the 07 Acura MDX. So hopefully, Lars, you can definitely give a bit more insight to what each of these roles really entailed. But following Honda, in 2010, Lars moved to LA and he actually joined Tesla initially as a senior design development engineer, particularly within the chassis design group. But over the next few years, Lars moved up the ranks, eventually becoming a senior director of uh, chassis dynamics, vehicle testing, and then PLM engineering 2018. And was finally and recently the VP of vehicle engineering in 2019. And so in his current role, Lars helps had a team of 1,000 engineers, technicians, analysts, and remains in charge of all of Tesla's vehicle hardware design, including body, interiors, exteriors, battery structure, you name it. He also currently suspends the development, sorry, spearheads the development of new, sus new systems in the growing company to ensure quality, reliability, and performance. And so some of his current projects include, you know, many of the models, including Model S, Model X, Model 3, Model Y, and pretty interestingly, Cybertruck and Semi-Trunk. So we're so excited to really kick off the Noon series, and we look forward to having us join us this week. And without a doubt, I mean, we'd love to kind of kick it away. Yeah, thanks, Rishi. I, you know, I guess I didn't realize I did all that stuff. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I wanted to talk to you all about, you know, knowing that there's a change makers course and, and it's in, in the school of engineering, I, I never really consider myself a change maker, like at least by choice. Um, but I, I'm definitely an engineer. Uh, I still think of myself as an engineer and I wanted to talk to you how I got to be at Tesla and how I got to be in this role. And, and like, how do I, how do you carry the entrepreneurial spirit when, when maybe like, you know, you, you think your background or, or, or your like, you know, field of study doesn't, doesn't really get you there. So I think um, to, to start that out, I, I'll just say, I, I never planned to be a, a vice president at a startup. It was never like a goal of mine. I never set out and said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to go to a startup and I'm going to start like trying to do something new. I think what comes out of that and how do you, how I got there was really around like current kind of core values I, I developed growing up and then finding the path that, that, that I wanted to take. Um, you know, for me, work ethic has always been important and, and dedication. You have to have passion in what you do um, and, and, and find that passion because that's something that no one can give to you. It has to come from within. Um, and you have to have sort of an education, whether it's formal and, and also experience. If you have those things and then you find the opportunity to, to become an entrepreneur, to become a leader um, in, in a segment, then, then you can really change the world. And um, I think those qualities for me came somewhat from my upbringing and, and then later my career choice. But as I said, you have to find yours. And, and, and so I'll take you through my path and then we can, I'm happy to answer any, any kind of questions. Um, in the chat, at like I, I see this, or the q and I see this question, like what is Elon like in person? I'll, I'll, I'll answer that later. But like, I, yes, I do work directly for Elon Musk. I have for the last almost four years, I guess now. And I've, I've known him for, for 12. Um, since, since I met him and, and interviewed with him. So um, anyway, when I was a teenager, I think this is really when I developed the passion for, for automotive. It's a weird thing at Tesla to be an automotive geek. Uh, I've been a car guy since I can remember. Um, this kind of started when I was spending my summers in Sweden. Uh, you know, Rishi mentioned I grew up in Chicago, but, but in, I spent every summer in Sweden with my family. And, um, you know, when my brother turned 16, uh, he got his driver's license. And so we wanted to be free because we lived out on this cow farm. And so um, my grandfather had a, like a old 1982 Volvo 760 in his barn that didn't work. And we decided that, or I rather, I decided we needed to get that working so we could go be free. Um, and my grandfather was really supportive. Like he knew nothing about cars. He was a, he was a chemical engineer, um, went around the world. Uh, installing water purifier systems in third world countries, which I think is pretty selfless. But um, in, in any case, he, he, he really pushed me to like get it running that summer um, so that we could do it. And he kind of taught me the balance of like 
working throughout the day and figuring out problems, but there was no, you know, like, there was no like teacher for me to figure out how, how the car worked. So I basically just took things apart and then put them back together, um, cleaned them, you know, looked for things that looked broken and then went to the auto parts store with my grandfather and, 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 and fixed it. And my, and my, um, you know, throughout that, he would ask me like the typical engineering questions, like, of, like, you know, sort of the, 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 the five why process of like, why doesn't this work? Why doesn't that work? What, and keep digging to find the root cause of the problem and fix it. And, you know, after about seven or eight weeks, we turned the engine one last time and it started running. And I think what that taught me was really that I had a massive passion for, for cars. Maybe it was about freedom. Maybe it was about that, but I think I found this passion and sort of thought, man, if I can keep, have something to keep my attention for like six weeks with no like reward or pay, or, I mean, I guess there was a reward, but, but you know, that is something you have to find and everybody has their own passion. You don't know what it is when, when you set it out, but if you find something that sparks that in interest in you, you got to follow it. And I'm very fortunate to have a job where I get to do my life's passion, you know, like to, to work on my life's passion every single day. And I think that's part of what motivates me and part of what motivates me to keep going. Um, it's really fun. It's like, you know, my wife, I think gets mad at me sometimes because I get to play at work. But uh, I, you know, I, I think if you have that, then work doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like a job. So I, I encourage you to go find your passion. Mine, mine started when I was younger and in and, and, and that story and some of those other stories of me taking apart things and putting them back together. And so I took that to Northwestern. Um, you know, I grew up in Chicago, so it was a way to stay close to my family, but also a great engineering school. Um, and I, I kind of focused my degrees on like, what would I want to know if I was going to go design cars? Um, and I always knew that from the day I went in there. So I, I sort of, uh, went into mechanical engineering for obvious reasons, but also thought if you're going to design a car, you really need to understand, um, you know, how those parts are made. So I, 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 I took a lot of courses in manufacturing engineering for that reason, because I, it, I knew that that formal education would ground me in the first principles for like the rest of my career. And to this day, when I interview people, like I think they get a little, little bit taken aback that I, you know, go back to strength and stiffness and mechanics of materials and some of the stuff you did in for your first, uh, um, you know, bit as a, as a, as a entry level mechanical engineering student. In any case, um, I, I, while I was at Northwestern, I, I, you know, formed those two degrees. And, and since I left, they have now changed that into one degree called manufacturing and design engineering, which is ironically what I was going for. And that curriculum has been growing since the late early 2000s. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of flattering to, for me. I actually met a guy in Reno when I was reviewing his battery line a couple of months ago, that was the graduate of that. And, and apparently there's like some legacy at Western now that I set forth with, with those degrees, again, unintentionally, but just focusing on what I want to do. So I got that formal education there, but I also took the time to, you know, really join groups that could get me experience beyond formal and, and sort of um, extracurriculars because there's no replacement for experience and doing things. Um, so I, I, I worked on the mini Baja team, which is a site of motive engineering group that built a little Baja racer and I founded Formula SE at Northwestern, both of which are still competing um, and really like tried to get hands on. And then I interned, you know, at various places like Siemens and, and, and uh, Ford and Honda, um, which is eventually where I went after I graduated. Um, so like, you know, by the time I had graduated Northwestern, I knew very clearly, like I wanted to design cars and I, I had gotten a job doing it, which was like, for me was like amazing. Um, and then I crafted my entire educational experience around it. And so like, again, this passion was there, but also that work ethic to actually learn in the classes, to actually absorb the knowledge and then apply them through experience, I think is critically important to set yourself up for success as a leader. Um, so when I got to Honda, I was a young kid and Honda was a really great place to grow up, I guess, as an engineer, they really believe in grounding all of their decisions and in, in engineering. And, and I got, I was very fortunate to work on some of those projects that uh, Rishi mentioned in particular, you know, one I can call out is the development of the active damping system. It was like 
there were like 12 people on this project. Everybody had been there like 20 years or more. And it was like a really big deal. And somehow I got assigned to it as like the, let's call it the low guy in the totem pole. Um, so a lot of, you know, work runs downhill. So I got a lot of work from all these really, really experienced engineers that, you know, whether it was system architecture or algorithm development or mechanical design. And, and you know, Honda has this really unique experience that I think teaches young engineers a lot called the Technical Evaluation Committee. And the Technical Evaluation Committee reviews everything that you do and everything you put into their products. And it's a group of engineers that have been there 30 plus years and have been through the experience again, because you can't replace that. And then they have this other concept of, of person in charge. Um, and person in charge is, is what they call the, the, the person that's leading the project. And I think that like, I can describe this experience where I had to go present to the technical evaluation committee as the person in charge of the active damping project. And, you know, it's very nerve wracking. You can get nervous to the point Victoria made earlier about public speaking. It's kind of, it's kind of that, except you're getting evaluated. And my chief engineer, one of the, well, there are a lot of chief engineers on this project, but one of them pulled me aside because he could tell that I was nervous. And he told me that my mindset was completely wrong. And that, and this is like a, you know, 65 year old Japanese engineer who'd been through the ringer, actually knew Sochiro Honda when he was growing up. And he's like, the reason that we call it person in charge is because that person knows more about the topic than anyone else in the room. And so the technical evaluation committee is, eva is not evaluating the person in charge. The evaluator's role was to assess the proposal that I was giving and their perspective came from all this experience. Um, and this like was to be expected that experience would be a part of any evaluation. But the technical validity of what I was doing was entirely my responsibility. And it was entirely on me as the engineer in charge, the person in charge to explain to them why it was a good idea why it made sense, why we made the choices or I made the choices that we did as a team to, to develop the product. And so um, I think this applies to me now and, and to really everything I've done that conversation because when you go into a room, a lot of people think the person in charge is the most senior person, right? Like I'm the, I'm, you know, often that is me in this, in, at my company. But like what I try to tell my engineers and the people that work for me is that I am not in charge, you are in charge, you need to make this happen. And I am only here to serve you, to help you get to that point. And I can lend you, you know, the 20 plus years of my experience now and, and, and tell you the horror stories of things that went wrong or the, you know, the things that you're doing right. But like the ownership is critically important. And um, I think that that is something I learned very early in my career and I've sort of carried it through from Honda in, into Tesla. And it's probably why I ended up where I'm at because I, everything that I do and everything that I'm responsible for, I take a, I take a really big uh, chunk of, of ownership. And I, I don't believe that it's anyone else's fault but my own if we fail or, or and if we succeed, you know, failure is often, what do they say? Failure is everybody's orphan, but success is, is everybody's um, son, right? Or, or, or child. And so I think, um, in that case, like, I, I, I kind of flip it. And I think failure is my child and success is, is, can be everybody's. Um, but in any case, I got an opportunity and that's the last thing you need to become an entrepreneur um, to, to come to Tesla. It's a really weird story. It was kind of the economic downturn uh, in you know, 2008, 2009. I was at a wedding in, in the Caribbean and one of my friends that was there was working out at Tesla and he said that they were forming a vehicle engineering team and that he had already given all, all our names to the, to the recruiters. So that opportunity kind of popped up and I had done some really cool things in Honda, but at this point in my life, I had to develop another passion, which was sort of about the environment and about um, you know, making sure that the world might be better than when I started, um, when I leave it. And, and I got a view of Honda's like 10 year engine roadmap. And this happens at big companies all the time. It became incremental. Um, and it became like stepwise. And so I, I was kind of distraught, especially because all our projects were canceled from the economic downturn and I got this new opportunity. So, you know, in my early thirties, I took it and, and decided to come out to, to Los Angeles to take a chance on something that really exuded my entire passion for, for, for not only work, but also like life. It was like a, 
you know, a confluence of ideas that I couldn't possibly have put together myself, which was a car company, my number one passion, that was trying to advance the world's adoption of sustainable transport and energy, which was becoming my secondary passion. And so now I had this like all wrapped up into one and I got the opportunity to come out and try and, um, you know, develop vehicles that people wanted. And the, the things I learned from Honda were immensely important in that, that you develop products that people love and you do that in a way that makes people want them without even knowing it. And if you do that, then they'll buy them. And so I took that into the dynamics of the vehicle that I was designing, um, you know, in, in, in the chassis world and uh, really kind of applied everything I had learned from my formal education and my educational experience. And what you'll find at a startup is that it is the ultimate meritocracy. And that means like, if you do good work and you do do it well, you will get more of it. So much to the point, like, I remember the, like the director that was in charge of our group, he was giving me my first performance review and he couldn't believe how much I knew after just eight years of, of working at Honda. And I told him, well, that, you know, I go in front of these groups and I spent a long time researching everything I, I, I had to talk about to make sure my decisions were right. Um, so anyway, he took, I took that on and, and then like, you know, how I got from senior engineer to VP is still a mystery to me. Um, but I, I think it, it relates to that ownership philosophy. I wanted to first design great parts, and then I wanted to make sure that the performance of the vehicle was great. And people around you, they feel that, they see that. Um, and, and you know, they Tesla and startups will reward you for having that. And so more and more over the years, I just got more responsibility. And then at some points I realized I had to reach out where I saw that that wasn't happening with the leaders in charge. And so I asked for more responsibility to, to kind of right the ship on certain things. Um, I remember I asked to own the NBH team, which is noise, vibration, and harshness. Uh, and Elon said, okay, um, because at the time our cars were really loud and I thought it was horrible and we should probably fix that. And I went in to talk to these team, you know, these new team members of mine and, and tell them I was going to lead the team. And I spent an hour getting ridiculed for being their opponent for so long. And whereas I had thought we had had a good relationship um, actually turned out that that we had had a really poor one and 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 that's something that was humbling and and it helped me become a better leader but but I immediately became that the advocate for that their advocate for the rest of the teams and we developed a strategy that now our cars are amongst the quietest on on the road again and and I think again you you have you have to realize as you work through that that passionate part of your career that sometimes your passion can overshadow other people's goals and really what you have to come back to is, is what are you trying to do as a company and make sure that the decisions you make are, are not for you or for, for um, your advancement, but, but actually for the product and for the company. And, and, and I, I, you know, that was just a reminder for me. And that's how, kind of how I operate now is, is I always make decisions about the customer and make sure that the customer is going to get the best experience and what's going to make them happy. And um, yeah, so then I got... Uh, the reward of, of having that spirit, the people around you want to be work with you. And, and, and so um, eventually I worked my way up to VP and, and uh, you know, from there it's, it's, it's still a journey that I love carrying. So, you know, I wanted to open the rest of this up for kind of a fireside chat and really banter about questions for the next 40 minutes or so. So that's my journey. That's how I got here uh, in, in a nutshell, some anecdotes. Um, but yeah, Rishi and, and, and Abby, I guess we're going to moderate from here on out. Um, if if you want to get started, I'm happy to answer all the questions yeah. you guys want to have. Uh, Rishi and Abby will start to get some individuals on for questions, but um, I have found something interesting happening with me. I don't know why, Lars, maybe because you said something before about being a, it sounded like a very sensitive child. Um <laughs> I found myself getting a little teary-eyed as you talked about your passion. And it's really not something I expected from an engineer from Chicago. Um, not that that means anything, but it means something. Um, and, and I am curious. So you do work for this larger than life person. Um, 
And you talked about that, you know, you had an interview with him and you have this passion and this incredible emotion that comes across. I am wondering, because at some point, uh, if they haven't already, all of our students will be interviewing with different people. Can you take us through that interview and how you prepared yeah, actually, and what happened? This is a funny story. Um, so I was at Honda, I was still working at Honda and you know, the interview process, you know, you kind of go, you know, you interview with a recruiter and then, you know, engineers and manager. And, and then at that time, Elon interviewed everybody because I was an employee like 200 and something. I don't know. Um, and so even though I was just a senior engineer, Elon was still interviewing people. Right. And, um, you know, Elon's schedule is fluid to say the least. And so like the interview time was like between one and 5 p.m you might get a call from an LA number. Um, you should pick it up. And so I'd like kind of, you know, I couldn't book out a whole afternoon. I was doing a lot of work and I still felt responsible for it. So I was going to meetings and, and then like in one of the meetings, I got a call. It would happen to be with, ironically, the VP of vehicle engineering at the time and I was presenting to him and I took the call, said, this is important. I got to take it. I'll be right back. Um, and I went into like the boiler room at Honda to kind of like hide because it was quiet, but it got a good cell reception. And I talked to Elon for probably like seven minutes. He asked me what was the most impressive thing that I had done as an engineer. Um, and I talked about how I had developed uh, a magnetorheological damper that uh, was basically self-healing over life. So I talked about the spalling effects of the nano iron particles that were in it and how that affected the force capabilities of the uh, magnetic coil that was in the core. And he just kept asking why, why, what, what? And he maybe asked me like six or seven questions deep. Later on, I found out this is how Elon tells you if you're actually a good engineer because you can keep answering the, the next reason behind the question. It's sort of one of the ways he judges talent. Um, you know, like I, I wasn't BSing him. I was telling him about the work I did. I was really passionate about it. And I was really like engaged with it. So then he hung up on me, which I thought was bad at the time. Also, by the way, at this point, like Elon would just like had founded PayPal. He wasn't like Elon Musk, we all know. So like, I actually didn't really know who he was. Like I just kind of knew like he was part of the PayPal thing. Um, anyway, he hung up on me. I'm walking back to the meeting with the VP probably like 10 minutes after this conversation started. And the recruiter calls me and he says, hey, Lars, I just got off the phone with Elon. You're good. He said, we need to find more engineers like you. And that was it. Um, and then kind of a funny story followed on from that. The next time I met Elon uh, was at Tesla. I was there and he came up to my desk and he said, are you Lars? And I said, yeah. And he said, did you get a letter from Honda lawyers? I said, yeah. He said, what'd you do with it? And I said, I ripped it up. <laughs> And he said, good. And then he walked away. He had gotten a seat, like a, basically an acknowledgement of my intellectual property as being Honda's and um, anything I used to advance Tesla's product was to be taken with caution. And um, it was pretty flattering, I guess. I, I didn't actually rip it up. I still have it framed because it was too Elon. You know, it's like, a, anyway, that's, that's kind of how my interview went. And I think you could probably feel the passion you talk about, Victoria. That's that's wonderful. I I I, I, uh, I actually Rishi, you had a question that you wanted to ask. I, I think everybody has questions, so uh, I'll let the students take it away. And Rishi, you want to go first? Yeah, it sounds great. So then, I guess one thing I would love to kind of hear a bit more about. So you've had an incredible track record at Tesla. You know, you landed the interview, and from there, it almost seems like it's been you know smooth sailing. But the reality <laughs> is, there's always challenges along the way, right? Yeah. Like Any major failures or weird things, you know didn't turn out the way you expected to, you know, maybe delays in production or just anything. We'd love to hear some stories in that front. I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of like company failures that you guys can read about. Like, and, and, and that's, you know, I was definitely a part of many of those and, and, and also the successes. But I think personally for me, like one of the biggest failures I ever had, I, so we were developing, uh, Model 3, and at that time, I owned Vehicle Dynamics, which is basically the ride and handling of the car. And, and you know, So Elon would um, drive cars as evaluations and, and then give you feedback. And so now I was in charge of this and like you know, presenting the car to Elon. And he got in the car with me. We drove like 15 seconds down the street. He turned around and came back and just laid into me about how stiff it was and how lacking it was in response for probably like three minutes of just like 
constructive criticism, we'll say. Um, obviously, that could get someone down, right? Um, at the end of the conversation, he said, how long is it going to take you to fix this? And I don't know why I said this to this day. I said three days, three days. And the, like the team behind me all looked at me like, what are you crazy, <laughs> three days? Um, and I guess like for me, you know, it, it was kind of soul crushing because I had presented him a car that I thought was wonderful and like was gonna like change the world from how it handled and, and, and drove, but he was not on the same page. And so, you know, I listened to what, and like after that, it's like, how do you bounce back from that failure, right? Because that was like an epic failure. Fortunately, we weren't in production. And I guess like for, as an engineer, you can always like separate emotion from the problem. And so like all of the, you know, superlatives and, 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 and feeling aside, the core was just the simple engineering problem. You thought the ride was too stiff and the response was too slow. Well, those are two things we can fix. And those are two things we know how to fix. And so like when I laid it out for the team to pick really them back up, cause like, I don't know, I have this weird thing where I don't really have like, you guys had some surprise you said emotion, but like I don't really read emotion very well. So it doesn't really affect me when other people are emotional. Um, but everybody else was kind of hurt. So, but I, I tried to break it down into this problem, laid out what we're going to do. Like day one, we're going to reset the ride frequencies and we're going to go way back to first principles. And we're going to find a ride frequency that people will think is comfortable. We actually read some papers on NASA. Um, we looked at like what the human response is for different ride frequencies as far as discomfort goes. And we found that like, if you want a car to, you know, if you, if you think about what you feel when your head is bouncing up and down in a car, like as you drive down the road, that can be akin to what you're doing as a human. Um, and, and what we realized is that if we wanted a car to feel nimble and athletic, we didn't need it to be stiff like most sports cars. We just needed it to make you feel like you were running. Um, and so we put the ride frequency just at that of, of what a human is when they're at a, like a, a, a quick sprint, which is like 1.3, 1.4 hertz. But kind of to answer your original question, like failures come in so many ways in your career. And it's not about the failure in the moment. It's about what you do with it afterwards. And I think for me, it's always about assessing the failure and the learning from it and changing and going forward. So um, working for a guy like Elon, it, it's, it's hard for people to, to see that because he is so direct with, with his feedback that, you know, people can get really downtrodden. But like, I think I've always broken it down to the problem at hand and, and engineers are generally really good at solving problems. So usually works for most of them. Yeah, no, that's some amazing advice there. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in all the successes, but to really understand the story behind it, I mean, it's a whole new level there. And so thanks so much. And I guess yeah. to kind of kick things off. I'd love to have Carla. Would you be able to like ask your question? Sure. Hi. Hey. Uh, so nice to see you uh, here. And yeah, my question is that you said sometimes your goals overshadow other people's goals. And I would like to know how you overcome that. Wow. Because that's that's a tough if one. You're, if you're passionate, I think that is yeah, I mean a challenge. It is a challenge, right? Thank like you. It, you know, when you're in a, I mean, it's, I always thought it was funny that people think engineers are like antisocial, right? Because we, we have to work in groups and teams and anything we do has to be a joint like effort. Nothing is accomplished alone. Um, and I think it's also comical that like people think Elon builds every vehicle that we make. Like it's, you know, there's like a hundred thousand people that are doing all this work. Um, and so what, what you have to like remember in any setting is that like your goals and your passion um, have their place but so do it so does everyone else's and so like often what i do when i'm in those situations is try to take a step back from from the discussion where it might be an argument or it might be like contentious and like look at the big picture and then actually pull this from my mother when my brother and i used to get in fights she would send us both in a room and say okay write down what you want to do and what you like about your brother um and so i kind of pull that out in 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 these meetings and like, okay, what are we trying to do? So Carla, what do you want to do? And then like, I say what I want to do. And actually like 90% of the time it's the same or really close to the same. And so then I build like those uh, common goals that people have into, into um, you know, 
a direction that we can build out of that discussion into something that we all want. Um, and one of the common examples in my career has been like, you know, a lot of people think there's a difference between quite a comfortable car and a sporty car, but like the reality is people kind of want both. And so you can find that compromise, but ultimately I think it's about aligning people's goals and finding the common ground. Um, I think that's true, not just in engineering, but also in like life. It's how I get through arguments with my wife too, right? So <laughs> I don't know, that's, that's my advice, Carla. I hope it helps. Sure, thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, I think Hari, I, I saw you up before. Are you still around? Hari Kumar? All right, Hari, unmute, come on. And when you do, we'll have you come on. In the, in the meantime, Nicholas Vieira, actually, you can tell me how to pronounce your name better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, do, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, great. Oh, so uh, Verrier, but, but, but yeah, thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, thank, thanks for thanks for being here, Lars. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering. Well, I was wondering many things, but I guess the first question that comes to mind is, do you have a routine, or what was the anchors like in your weekly planning uh, as a oh, VP? Man. Do I have a routine? I don't. I wouldn't say I have a routine, but like every day when I wake up. Um, I don't have it with me, I'd show it to you. It's, it's at my desk, but I write down five things I wanna get done on a three by five note card. Um, because I think there's only so much time in a day, right? And as a VP, everybody wants to talk to you about what they wanna do or what, what um, topics they think are important. But what you can't, you have to remember is it's, it's my job to steer the entire engineering organization. And at times like to do that, I have to do what I think is important. So I write down these five things um, and when I get into the office, before I open my email, before I uh, take a meeting, I, I make sure that I take action on those five things, either whether it be a phone call or an email, or I go talk to someone in person, or I go see a test being run. Um, and those five things, you know, could vary from, you know, like solving the world's, you know, biggest problem to remembering to thank someone for staying late the night before. Um, so I, I don't know that routine will ever, in fact, I don't think you should ever have a routine because like it implies a sense of monotony that I don't think is very innovative. But um, I think it's important to remember that you have a job to do and, and that you make sure you're doing that every day. I mean, you don't have to use a three by five note card. I think there's like phones and stuff nowadays. So <laughs> Maybe a little bit better tool, but I'm, I'm old and so I write it down. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, I should have asked you this before, Lars. Do you have any water or anything? I do. I'm good. Teresa brought me a bunch. Yeah. Fantastic. And now, Hari, uh, you are up. I, um, yeah. My, my main question was, like, in your time at Honda, obviously a very fundamentally different company than Tesla, given mm -hmm. that um, they're more focused on gas cars. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest difference you've seen in the way the two companies operate? I think, yeah, that's a good question. A lot of people ask me that. Um, you know, I used to say I was from Honda, like to everyone, but now I've been here so long, I think I, could, I say I'm from Tesla. But, you know, Honda has developed over the years a really great engineering process, um, like one of the best in the world, to, to make sure that they build products that are, you know, appealing, reliable, uh, cost efficient. And, and like keeps the company afloat. You know, Honda's never sold, sold a car at a loss. And, 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 and I think it comes from that sort of rigor and efficiency. But the, but the thing that's stifling in that kind of environment is that because the process is so rigorous, it's very hard to innovate. It's very hard to change. Um, and it sort of like doesn't really promote great engineers or great minds, whether whatever part of the industry they're in because the process is so rigid that you kind of just like end up checking these boxes for to meet the certain gate that you're at. And once you check all the boxes, you know the car is gonna be good, but you don't know if it's gonna be great. And, and so like, it kind of boxes it into like, they're always gonna make good cars. They're never gonna make a great car. And it doesn't matter how good you are as an engineer because the process is so rigid that like the, the machine sort of outputs good. Um, when I came to Tesla, there was literally zero process, literally nothing. 
And we had amassed, like, so to this day, I still think some of the greatest engineers that I've ever worked with. And so we relied completely on the individual. That person in charge bit I, I uh, talked about from Honda, totally different world with Tesla. Like you were definitely in charge because there was no one else to do it, no process to fall back on and no history. So, and the result, I guess, of that was, you know, first the Roadster. I worked on the tail end of the first Roadster Sport 2.0. I did some wheels. Um, and this was like a, like a shock and awe for me because at Honda, we would like design wheels to cost as cheap as possible. And, you know, all four wheels were the same. And I got to Tesla and I, they wanted me to do new wheels and the front and rear were different sizes because of the split fitment on the tires. And then the left and right were like mirror images because they had this like fan um, design. And so they wanted the fan to be moving the same way, whether you're looking at the car from the left or the right. So I had four part numbers for wheels on a car that was gonna make like a thousand units where the Honda like that would never have flown. Um, and so I think the difference is like Honda, great process, doesn't matter how good of an engineer, good car. Tesla, no process, great engineers, great car. Um, and so I've tried to like strike that balance as I've kind of grown up here and like process is good. You need process at some level, but like you have to have an environment that allows people to think and allows people to apply their ideas to the products and the, the work that they do. Otherwise, um, you're going to end up with only good and good isn't good enough. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, Victoria. We yes, can... I am. You know, I like I'm technically challenged. Um, I thought it would be fun to have Anya come and ask her a question, if that's okay, Anya. Yeah. Um, so um, my name is Anya. Um, I'm double majoring in geeks and mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And um, I um, actually have a hand injury, so I haven't really been able to do the hands-on experience that you were speaking of how you did in your undergrad. So I was kind of curious, like if you had any alternative ways to still get like that experience of like building stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I think the most important way to do that is 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 to to find any kind of project. Like, you know, internships are great, but they're not everything. Extracurriculars are great, but they're not everything. You have to find something that you're passionate about and do it and own every bit of it. Um, it could be a side project to build a robot, you know, like if you want to do that, or um, you know, it could even be building an app that you want to get online to help people find where the nearest COVID testing site is. But you have to figure out how to build something real and you have to own every bit of it. And like that, from that, I mean like concept and idea, like white sheet of paper, there's nothing to like actually building the thing in the end. And it could be anything from, like I said, an app to a robot to a race car. But like, you know, without that sort of like failure experiment that you're going to experience as you do that, I, I just don't, I don't think you can really get the most out of your undergraduate experience. Like you could be the best engineer in the world when it comes to books, but if you don't develop that critical judgment of how to progress a project when, as Carla was talking about, you know, like what if passionate people have two ideas? You're gonna have to be able to make those judgments and they don't teach you that in the school uh, as much as they should. It's hard to teach that, it comes from experience. So make sure you find it. Thank you. Thanks, Lars. Uh, Rishi, shall we go to Kai next, who's been kind of waiting patiently? I think you had the first question. Oh, man. I saw that one. Well, I would say try to find a different way to ask that question. Yeah, I, I actually have, um, I guess, two questions. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, the first one is, you know, what's he like? But uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a more personal one. I am in the process of starting a company right now. And I know that like, for me, having to manage like 24 different people doing, you know, building a cool app and, you know, algorithm design, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, how do you, I, I guess, manage the task of managing a thousand plus people? That sounds, I mean, 24 for me is hard, you know, <laughs> and a uh, you know, thousand plus is like ridiculous. So, yeah. I mean, 
to answer the second, first question second, but like to, to answer how to manage people, it's you have to get, make people accountable and hold them accountable. You can't own everything. You can't pretend to make every decision. You, it's just not possible. And so what I do is I, you know, assign leaders and, and assign ownership. Um, just today I was in a meeting and it was like, you know, we're worried about corrosion of a certain part of the car. And there's like the materials team is in there talking about how corrosion happens and like the design engineers in there, the manufacturing engineers in there. And it's like, okay, you can't have like ownership by committee and you can't have me owning everything. So you have to appoint someone in charge of that multifaceted problem for all the other four people. And then you have to hold them accountable if they suck. <laughs> this is the truth. Like, um, so I would say like, find people you trust, find people that you think can make those hard decisions and then like make them accountable for the things that you think are most important in the moment. Um, and if they're not like, you, especially in the startup mentality, like you can't be a haven for, you know, job security. You got to have the people that are going to make the product and the, the thing you're trying to build good. So if they aren't cutting it, hold them accountable, give them another chance. And then that's it. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want me to expand on anything there. Maybe I'm coming across a little too harsh. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's fair, you know, so. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, 24 people is a big team. So you, you're going to have to divvy it up. I mean, if you imagine there's 40 hours in a day, if you talk to each of them for a week, you know, I know with startups, you're probably working 70, but like you can only devote an hour to each of them. You'd be only left with, you know, 36 hours or 46 hours to work. It's, it's not a lot. Um, so you're going to have to find ways to shorten that up. Anyway, to the question of like, what's Elon like? I mean, like the, bit, the simplest thing I can say is he's a person. Like a lot of people think he's like this larger than life thing, but like he eats like we do. He, you know, he has um, phone calls and, and commitments and understands to Victoria's point when you put him to voicemail, um, which I did earlier today, which is why she was bringing that up. Um, but I think like the real thing is that he's very direct in, in what he does. Like he is a really great um, evaluator of talent, like in, 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 in ability, like the, the, the superpower that Elon Musk has is not all this, but all of his ideas. It's his ability to find people to execute those ideas at every level, um, whether it's finance or sales or engineering. Um, you know, I, I think the thing that I, I you know, I, I don't know that I've modeled much after him, but the thing that I try really hard to do is like copy that sort of ability where he questions the people more than the topic and make sure that they're making good judgments and, and follow that. But yeah, he's, he's a, he's direct. He's a little bit quirky. Uh, and he's pretty tall. Um, and he just does, doesn't waste time. And in, 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 in if, if he gets something, he wants to move on to the next and, and, and talk about the real problems. He spends all his time on problems and none on successes. So um, that's my short answer. Probably shouldn't say too much more. <laughs> Well, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good luck, by the way. Thank you. Same to you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Who's next? <laughs> yeah, I guess we can have Raid. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, you got it spot on. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Lars. Uh, your, your talk has been really inspirational to say the least. Um, one thing that resonated with me uh, was you specifying your passions, that being uh, car design and manufacturing, and then mm -hmm. your second passion being um, developing a car that considers uh, sustainability and environmental impact. I was just curious to know, have you like came to a stance or a point where these passions kind of dried out and you lost a sense of motivation to continue, continue doing the work that you are currently doing? And if so, like, how do you approach that scenario? Because I, I don't know about everyone else because I struggle with defining my passions because it's such a big part of life outside of the money. I think that's a huge determinant in your career field. So I was wondering if you can provide us with some insightful uh, input on 
how you approach those scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I, like in in short, to answer the first part of your question, like has my passion dried up? I, I, I don't think so. In fact, a lot of people tell me they're confused at how passionate I still am having been here so long. Um, but when you find something that you really care about, like you won't have a problem letting go of it. But do passions change over time? Sure, they do. Um, you know, I like call myself a car guy. I still love to drive cars. You know, I used to like drive them on you know, racetracks and, and, and go through the mountains and really enjoy that. I don't, I don't do that as much anymore, but like I've been fortunate enough like within Tesla to be able to adapt the global passion I have into different segments of the business. And so like, you know, to Kai's question earlier, it's like, how do you manage 24 people? Well, like when you're in a lull in a project or maybe you can't find the drive, you've got to find a problem that you can find the drive for because there's so many things to do and, and you put your effort into that in the moment. So like, you know, while I don't get to daily, you know, develop cars and, and ride and handling anymore, I still get to do it once in a while and, and poke my head in. Um, I find more passion in, in, in building out teams and, 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 you know, inspiring young people to be in charge of what they do. And, and so like, I think you have to realize that like, it's never going to be the same and it's always going to adapt. And if you find yourself waning on a, on a project or, or something, find a way to, you know, motivate yourself in a different area of that project while maybe you can unload some of the stuff that's dragging you down mentally into an, um, to someone else and the other thing I guess I'll say is like you have to balance your life like I, someone asked me this once in a, in a news article and I, I think it got twisted I'm probably going to screw it up again um but they asked me like how my work-life balance is and I said something like oh I've been working 24 7 since the day I started it's not about when you work it's about when you don't work and finding the time for yourself and they like Kind of twisted that into the 24 seven comment. But I guess what I meant was, you know, what fuels me isn't necessarily the work, but it's like spending time with my family and, and making sure I lead a reasonably healthy lifestyle and I have enough time to work on the, you know, five cars that I have in my garage so that I know when I come into work, like I'm fueled with that, like energy that I got from all those activities that give me joy. Um, and there's no one, no one's going to like give you that. You have to take it. And so I always make sure that I'm, you know, there to put my kids in bed and, and I take them to school every morning. And, and that's like, seems crazy for people that I do that. But like, without that, I don't know how I would get through the day. So um, I don't know. I hope that helps. I, you know, that's my two cents. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, thanks for that answer. I, I thought that was really spot on. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Raid. So I think Theo, you have a really interesting question. A lot of students upvoted it. So could you please come on? Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Theo. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so thank you so much for, for sharing this story. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you actually uh, build trust uh, with like international partner, with investor, with mm. all those uh, ecosystem especially in a in a very competitive and also capital intensive industry uh, which is automatically in its yeah um i think that this is a good tough one like early on early days when we didn't have a lot of product you know going out the door and we, we didn't have um you know like revenue like we do now uh we had to get investors on board and and, and so i learned a bit about that and i think um what i can say is like you have to present yourself in a way that, you know, shows you know what you're talking about. And if that means bringing people into that conversation that know what they're talking about, you better damn well bring them. Because like, even if you're the, you know, the entrepreneur, or you're trying to, maybe you're in sales or finance and you need to talk about the product to get investors on board, then bring the engineers that know about the product. Um, we did that a lot. I, I remember like we would bring these investors around and they would sit at our desks and we would show them what we were doing to really show them how, you know, advanced it was and shook and then also like we you got to be honest about like the, the shortcomings like you know a lot of people try and sell their ideas like you know one in a million and you know no chance of failure well that's that's a lie right like <laughs> everything has a chance of failure and i think investors want to understand the risk and so do partners 
And so you got to balance like with what you're trying to do and, and with what you think might happen if you fail or some problems you might see in the way. And maybe you don't have to open the full door to them, but like I think showing that vulnerability will also build trust because trust is about honesty. And, and, and um, you know, that's true in business as well as, you know, relationships. And, and I think that when you do that, you'll find that a lot more people are willing to help. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Can we have Jack to join us? Hi, Jess. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Yep. Hi. Thanks so much, Lars. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back and ask you about your role as a problem solver. Um, so you mentioned asking to, to take on more responsibility with certain projects and teams. There were those interviews with senior leadership where you were trying to boldly communicate that the company should really take on this problem of making vehicles quieter. And of course, what can come out of an interview like that is like, yes, we agree the company should do this, but also, gee, who's going to be the one to spearhead a team that takes on that endeavor? Um, and I know, you know, a startup can be really collaborative, but depending on the company, that fast paced environment can also leave the door open for a little bit of competitiveness, like new hires start comparing notes on how much equity they're being offered, et cetera. Um, but you seem to have this really inspiring playbook of just sort of keeping your head down and keeping it focused on solving problems. And so I was just wondering, could you share your advice on, you know, if you're asking to take on more responsibility, what is a way to really keep the emphasis on your desire to make a positive impact rather than, you know, more personal stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I'm going to have a good answer. Uh, but like, I guess, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people that want to advance their career. And so they'll come to you to, to say, hey, I want to take on more responsibility. And like the immediate thought is, okay, you just want to get climb the ladder, right? I think that at the times that I've done that, it, it, it hasn't been in a situation where it was about me. Like it, it, maybe in the, I mean, I shouldn't sound so altruistic to say that like, yeah, I didn't want more responsibility. That's That would be a lie too, but I've always like looked at the the problem that is in the room and, and like when you can see that there's a real problem or a gap, right? Like, and in this particular case with, with the quietness of our car is like there was a gap, right? And nobody was filling it. Um, I think it's it's a it's a good opportunity to 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 fill the gap. And so my advice to people is always like, you know, it's nice to want to advance your career, but there needs to be both the need, and in this case the gap and the opportunity. And those things don't always coexist. So you can have some skill and you might be able to take on more, but if there's no opportunity, it doesn't matter. And so what I would say is like, find the time when the opportunity presents itself and don't be shy then, you know, and, and, and um, then people sort of see it as like, okay, this person's trying to help the team maybe more than they're trying to do my job or take over my role. Um, and then, like I said, man, that, that first, yeah, Jack, that fir fir first conversation with that team did not go well. And, and um, I think when that happens, you've got to be humble about it and say, yeah, maybe I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm going to be your biggest advocate. I'm going to be the one that goes to all the senior leadership and says, we have to do this. Um, and that's what I did. And I think, you know, that that sort of ownership of like, this is now my problem, not, not your problem, like will garner you that that support that you need to take over the team. And, and um, in that way, you present yourself, not just as trying to advance your career, but trying to advance everybody. Is that helpful? I don't know. Like, Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. These are fun. It makes me think about what I'm trying to do with my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully it's been fun, you know, especially for us as students, you know, learning so much. It's been really insightful so far. Alejandra, you've been kind of patiently waiting over here. So do you mind coming on? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much, Lars, for being with us here today. Um, as thanks an MBA student, <laughs> my, my question is going to be, I guess, a little bit more high level and kind of like business oriented. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about today, um, talking to a bunch of startups in, in Chile in particular, because that's where I'm from, how do you think about the necessary infrastructure to expand into countries outside of, of the US and some of the Nordic countries? Um, and I guess like taking a step back, what does international expansion look like for Tesla in the next five to 10 years? So like, are you, is this, you wanna answer this specifically to Tesla and like how we think about that as a problem? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, like, it's, I mean, it's it's obviously a problem that goes beyond Tesla. It's more yeah. just like electrical vehicles in general. But how does Tesla specifically view this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like understanding the the individual international situation is, is um, delicate in automotive. So like, you have to first understand, we, we had to first understand like what we could do and couldn't do. And, and, you know, when you talk about the Nordics, like what we realized, I think in maybe 2011 is that Norway was like well on their way to, to, to being like our ideal scenario for a market. Um, and so we sent a team there. Um, fortunately, Norwegian is close to Swedish. So I got to go to really understand what the consumers wanted and what the government wanted. Um, and now I think last year, something like 90% of cars sold in Norway were either electric or a hybrid, like 70% electric, 20% hybrid, and, and only 10% internal combustion. And I, I have to say that like, that is because Tesla came in there and, and you know, years and years ago and, and met not only with consumers that wanted to buy the cars, and we made sure that our cars were like reliable for winter weather, which was not um, easy coming from California and trying to convince people, but also like we worked with the governments to understand the infrastructure of the electrical grid. And I think that's in part like why we got into being, you know, again, solving that problem. Like a lot of people don't know Tesla is an energy provider. Um, you know, like islands in the Pacific are entirely powered by Tesla solar panels and, and, and mega packs. Um, Samoa is one. Um, but it's so I think like when we thought about it back then and, and now, you know, we're in like 192 countries. So like yes, there's more expansion to be had and, and, and like we need to find ways to get into it. But the way we look at it isn't sort of like on a, how hard is it going to be to enter this, which in some cases is there, but it's more about like what opportunity is there for the mission if we go there. And so the reason we went to China was like there's a big opportunity with, with the advent of, you know, wealth growth there and, and into consumerism that we thought we could take advantage of. And, and, and we did pretty well in Europe now with, with um, you know, Gigabit Factory Berlin. So I think over the next years, it's really just about penetrating those markets and finding the right product for them and making sure that we deliver it. Um, and yeah, I think the only way to do it as a company is to like not assume that what you have today will work there. It's to actually get with the people that are there because cultures are different across the world. And like what we think is great in the US, like, you know, the Germans might absolutely deplore right and so if you can build a product that is adaptable in that way then you can have something that will work globally but you can't make the mistake that something that works here will work in china or something that works in china will work in europe you have to really understand how your product needs to adapt and we took a long hard look at that and, and, and it's it's working um in, in in various countries and and um we'll continue to do that over the next years Thanks. Oh, How are you doing, Lars? You need a break, a cup of water, anything? You know, a lot oh, of rapid questions. Hanging uh, in there? Yeah, I'm hanging in. Oh, now we only okay. have a few minutes left, so I'm not, I'll try and answer as many as I can. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's so many questions, but just not enough time in the world. But time being, I mean, Nikki, could you come on? Here, let me add you. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to start by saying, I think your story is so inspiring. I really enjoyed listening to you speak about all your different successes uh, and your growth over the course of your career. I sort of wanted to focus a little bit more on some challenges you might have faced. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, was there ever a period of time where you felt behind or experienced self-doubt, for example, with others getting promoted over you or people taking on projects and roles that you had dreamed of? And then in that period of time, how did you deal with that and personally grow to the point where you could take on the projects that you really wanted? Yeah, those are good questions. I think um, the self-doubt one is interesting. Maybe I'm like an anomaly here, but like I, I the, you know, it's the hardest thing in the world to believe in something. Um, and I think you need to find a way to believe in yourself, like above all, like, you can do amazing things if you apply yourself to it. And I've for a long time believed that to be true of, of me and, and what I think my capabilities are, but it's also really important to know your limitations. So, um, you know, I think when I was a teenager and even through college, I had a lot of self-doubt, but like through the experience that I talked about and through like the, the work that I put in, I knew that like, 
you know, I actually do know what I'm talking about, right? Like um, when it comes to, to, to the engineering aspects I have. And I think when you're in those moments, there's like four places you can be in sort of that confidence, you know, what they call it doubt and confidence um, scale. If you get like a scale, of like, you know, I'm confident or I'm unconfident and, and I'm right or I'm wrong. But you have to, I always ground myself in like, it's okay to be doubtful and, 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 and right or doubtful and wrong. Um, it's okay to be confident and right, but it's definitely not okay to be confident and wrong. And so like, whenever I'm in those moments, I kind of take it back and say, okay, like, what do I know to be true? I'm confident these things are true. And so I'm confident and right about this. I'm unconfident about these things, or I'm doubtful about this, whether it's me or my aspects. And, and I, like, I kind of put them in these quadrants. And then I really focus on improving those things that whether it's a problem or me, a personality issue I have or whatever about the doubts that I have and try and bring them up to the confident and right area of, of the quadrant. So um, I think you gotta ground yourself in that sometimes. I, I like to take myself back to those kind of things rather than getting high on my own supply. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, like the, the saying I often tell my team is, is don't worry, it'll be okay in the end. Because if it's not okay, it's not the end. Um, and there's always a, a future and there's always a next step. And a lot of people forget that in the moment. So um, as long as you keep fighting for, for, for those truths and, and, and remember that there is a tomorrow, I, I, I don't think you, 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 you'll find yourself in doubt. But when you get there, remember, there are things you still know and there are things that you can be confident in and, and, and build off those and, and day in and day out. And, and, and then you'll, you'll get where you want to go as it relates to like advancement or promotions like I, I've just never compared myself to anyone never never wanted to be you know the next Elon Musk or or, or, or whatever I just wanted to be the best version of me that I could be and um, that comes from work and like working on yourself and being honest about your flaws and then trying to address them and if you do that then like you know your time will come like people will recognize it and, and, and the work will, will be there so it's like a very wholesome answer, but like, I truly believe in those things. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, really well spoken there. So I guess Thomas, am I asking your question next? Yeah, Thomas here, Laos, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, 12 years ago, uh, Elon Musk asked, asked you a question, what is the most impressive, impressive thing that you have done as an engineer? 12 years after, after 12 years at Tesla, I wanted to know what is the most impressive thing that you have done as an engineer? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, okay, so back when we were, this is maybe not the most impressive, but this is one that I'm really proud of. It's pretty cool. So like engineering is about stories and work and effort. So this one I like to tell people. So back in model three days, like we were going hog wild on automating the, the factory and like, we're going to automate assembly and do all the stuff you guys probably read about it. And um, one of the things that we got hung up on was when you build a car at the end of the assembly line, like you roll the car off and then you do all these tests to like make sure the car works. Right. And we sort of got hung up on this idea or, or maybe you do tests and adjustments. Right. Um, that like, why are we testing the car at the end? Why do we only know it's okay at the end? Why don't we know it to be better up front? And one of the things that I got tasked with at the time was like, at the end of the line, you always do a, a wheel alignment. You know, you guys probably go to like Pep Boys or whatever and get your cars aligned every now and then to make sure the tires are pointing the right way. And I remember like, I, we were gonna present to Elon how we were gonna do this. And I had my whole team there and we had worked on it and like we were ready to like tell him how we were going to do it in line. And, and um, his position going in was we shouldn't need to do an alignment because we should just put the car together right the first time. Right. And so my boss at the time comes out of meeting with Elon prior to this meeting. We're all waiting outside and he pulls me over to the side and he's like, hey, Lars. He's in a really bad mood. Um, you know, like, I, th I just think you should go in. Like, don't bring anyone else. It's not going to be good. And so we go in there. And so I'm like, okay. So I go tell the team, like, hey, you're not going in. I, I, you know, they want me to just go in by myself. So I went in and I spoke one on one with Elon about vehicle alignment. Um, and he gave me this speech about Legos and how Legos are made all over the world. 
to the micron precision level. And you can put any Lego made in any part of the world and it will fit into the next Lego. And I gave him all the engineering data about why we needed to align a car and springs in series and manufacturing tolerances and bushings and compliances and tires and rubber. And then he gave me the speech about Legos. And after about an hour of arguing, I said, okay, Elon, but Legos don't drive straight. And he said, okay, Lars, you can align the car. You only get to touch the bolt once. You don't get any humans and you can't do it at the end of line. I was like, okay. So, so I got out, I go to the team. I'm like, guys, you're, it's great, great success. We get to align the car. And then I laid out all these tasks um, that we had, you know, as, as, as constraints on the problem. And the, for all the automation stories that, that went poorly in model three, this one worked and it worked smashingly. We put it at the end of marriage. Um, we align a car nine times faster than a human can do it, nine times more precise and nine times more accurate. So all our cars track super straight um, and, and you know, can be very precise. And um, when I saw that thing running, it's like a dancing, you know, like symphony of robots and, and gantries and actuators. There's four six axis robots. There's 13 gantries. There's four torque guns, you know, like 150 different pneumatic cylinders and like car comes in and 42 seconds later it comes out perfectly aligned and uh i don't know it's pretty cool to see still it's actually on the tour if you ever go to fremont it's like in the corner of the cell and they show it off but like i'm pretty proud of that one because it was a it was a tough conversation a lot of constraints really cool outcome i remember there was a vendor that we tried to get to make this and they walked by and he was doing some work on the other thing and he's like holy shit you got it to work because they told us it would be impossible and uh yeah, it's kind of exciting to see that kind of like stuff come to fruition. And it's weird for me because it's manufacturing and I always thought it would be about designing cars. So I got to find a passion in a different thing. And, and um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Thank you. That's an amazing answer. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty amazing more, but... right? And I'm kind of curious, you know, what it looks like for the next 12 years, right? You know, you've done the last 12 years. And so that kind of looks so right, basically aligns right with uh, Jeremy's question. Yeah, so good evening. And again, thanks for joining us. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, as a self-professed car guy, you're effectively in charge of designing a technology that takes your hands off the wheel. And I want to know how you feel about that. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, Autopilot is a completely separate organization that I don't actually own, um, that Elon manages directly. But like, how do I feel about autonomous things? Like, I don't know. I got kids, man. I don't ever want my kid to drive a car. Like, that's like how I like mentally feel about it is like, I remember me as a 16 year old driving, I definitely don't want my daughter in a car with me. Right. Um, and so I think that like the thing I focus on from from those systems is like, there's a lot of good that comes from them that doesn't make the press, you know, like, it's true that when you're an autopilot right now, it's there's 10 times less opportunity, or like the stats are 10 times less likely to get in an accident. And so whether cars become fully autonomous in the time or, or or when I should say cars become fully autonomous, I think it's okay because, you know, if you look at like the horse and buggy, people still ride horses for sport. It doesn't take away my passion. Like people are still gonna make cars that are fun to drive. And I think the cool thing for me right now is I get to balance like making a super fun car to drive, you know, like the Model S Plaid that we just did. You know, we went towards autonomy with the steering yoke and all this sensors and suite we put in it. But, you know, that car also goes around the Nürburgring pretty damn fast. Um, and we're not even done with that that fun part yet. I think Elon lets me do that just so he, I can stay here. But um, <laughs> you know, I think I, I have mixed feelings to be honest. But I think that the safety it brings is is truly world class and humbling. And like no one, that's one thing we all get behind. That anyone who's a car guy or car, you know, is that you want a safe car, and and, and um, you know, our our systems do that, and they'll they'll do that whether a driver's in there or not. And I I hold no doubt that there will always be a great driver's car. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I guess we only have a few minutes left. I mean, I honestly, just where's the time gone? And so, Abby, would you mind sharing your screen? We're actually going to be posting up essentially the attendance code. So how it's going to kind of work for all the students that every week we'll have an amazing speaker and in order to receive credit for attendance, so we go into B courses and actually submit the code. So, Abby, would you all share it? Yes, sounds good. Yeah, and in the meantime, oh, Vicky, do you want to say something? I just wanted to say 
how proud I am of you all for keep going. I'm now on my phone. These things happen. Um, so thank you, Lars. Uh, we're, we'll still keep talking, but I want the students to know that we really take the feedback that you provide um, very, very seriously. And I forward it also to Lars, Lars, whether you want it or not. Um, and so please uh, be honest in, in the feedback that you give. And, and this is uh, how we take attendance. So, you know, Tesla, capital T-E-S-L-A, exclamation mark one. And uh, you all can access that quiz on B courses and we can keep on talking, I'd say. Great. Oh, Isha, would you be able to turn on your screen? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, no problem. Yeah. So um, I recall that you said that you separate work from emotion, but I personally find this difficult, especially when working at a startup company and facing like failure or constant changes to the original product design, you know, due to unforeseen circumstances. So I was just wondering, how do you keep yourself from becoming overwhelmed with projects and tasks and yeah, ultimately failure? Don't, <laughs> I mean, that's the short of it. I think I get overwhelmed a lot um, and, and, and like, it's hard to deal with, to be honest. You know, I think I would be lying if I said, yeah, it's super easy. And I, like, but what I, what I try to do is what I said a little earlier um, is I try to orient my thoughts in the morning and, and take that time to figure out what I need to do today to make myself feel like I completed something because it's, it's really easy to, to, to get lost. I mean, to get lost in emails and meetings and, and getting work done, like it's hard. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I have a, I have a, passion for cooking and my wife wonders why I cook so much and I was like oh it's because it's easy you start and then at the end you have a meal and then you like did something and so I, I try to find snippets of that like work where I can see results in, in 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 day to day so that I feel like I'm getting stuff done and on the weekends on Sunday nights I sit down and I write down on like you know I guess I should stop telling you how much I use paper but I write down like all of the things I have to do regardless of if I'm going to do them that week or not. And I, I mean, I literally have a to-do list. that's like, you know, a giant sheet of paper and, and I cross them out day to day. And, and like, the reality is like, there's always going to be more work, work to do. There's no shortage of work. Like there's a labor shortage now. Like to, really, there's no shortage of work. And you can only like address yourself day to day on what you got done that day because there's only a finite amount of time in a day and you can only do those things in that day. So I just make sure that I'm always getting stuff done every day and then um, ground myself in that tomorrow when I get overwhelmed again. But look, I'm not gonna lie to you, Isha. Like I am a grown man and sometimes I break down in like, tears with how much work I have to do. So um, it happens. You just gotta have a good support system to pick you back up. Like my, uh, my son's really good at noticing when I'm in that mood and he just hugs me. So get yourself one of those. That's really sweet. Thank you. Thank right. you. This is a tough one. Uh, Cian, could you uh, come on? Uh, yeah, do you hear me? I'm yep. Hi. Barbara. Yeah. So I think other students already asked about Tesla questions. So I will ask your personal question. <laughs> Sure. Uh, what is your next direction? What are you looking for now uh, in near future or further future? Your personal direction? Yeah. Yeah, my, I don't know. Like, what is my personal direction? I mean, I've still, I still find a lot of passion in what we do. I, you know, a lot of people think Tesla's mission is, is, is done or we completed it, you know, the master plan's complete. But like, I really still feel like if we actually want to change the world to, you know, sustainable energy and transport, like we got to keep going. We're sort of the beating heart of the industry. We got to prove to people that you can build more and more and more, and we got to drag the whole industry with us. So there's a lot of work to be done there and scale. You know, we built almost a million cars and sold them last year. You know, the global average of new cars sold is like a hundred million cars. So it's like 1%, you know, it's nothing. It's like a rounding error. We got a long ways to go. Um, and, and we got to bring the industry with it. You know, I think EV sales were something like 1.6%, you know, so we did one 
and then the rest of the industries did 0.6. So for all the news and hoopla about everyone going electric or sustainable, like I still think we got a big task to go. So for us, it's a, for me in particular, it's about scale and, and making sure that we're making millions and millions and millions of cars and that rest of the industry is following us. Because as long as they have that like beacon of like who they're chasing after, which, which has been us for a long time and now they're trying to get there, you know, with, with um, you know, a lot of the initiatives, VW, Hyundai, everyone going, Volvo going all electric. We still have to be that beating heart. So, so we're going to do that. We're going to do it at scale. And, and, and I find a lot of passion in that. I really like manufacturing. I think it's the hardest thing to do. Like it's super easy to build one of anything. It's super hard to, you know, when you go to the factory, Fremont cranks out, you know, 12,000 cars a week, you know, it's like 2000 cars a day. And they're like, they're all the same. You know, that's like hard to do. And I find joy in, 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 in doing that. So I'm definitely going to be a part of that mission. And, and like, you know, long-term future, you know, I, when I think we're done here, you know, maybe I'll end up cooking for people uh, at a real bed and breakfast or something, kind of rest myself <laughs> um, after the years of work. Uh, Thank you, That is great and probably a great place for us to uh to rest as well um thank you lars this has been incredible i'm not sure if uh since i had some technical issues if you were asked this but is there a way for students to reach out to you or how how would you uh recommend if anybody wanted to reach you how would they do that or should we leave you alone you, you can say that <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm always happy to help. I can't promise that like I'll get back to you. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You can get to me there. Remind me that um, you know you saw me in this in this talk or whatever, and I'll try to respond. But like, yeah, it's, I'm 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 super supportive of of finding great engineers and helping them do great in their career. So I'll do my best to get back and, and you know talk to you however I can. I cannot imagine a better way for us to have kicked off the series. I know you were supposed to speak last uh, November and things happened for a reason. Uh, it was incredible listening to you and you um, are inspiring and it'll be a hard act to follow the rest of the semester, but uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, especially to the student coordinators, Rishi and Abigail, for keeping things running and Big, big thanks to this incredible group of 400 plus students. Uh, wishing everybody a fantastic semester. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay excited. <laughs>